In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Let us make confession of our sins to God, our Heavenly Father. Almighty God, our Maker and Redeemer, we poor sinners confess unto you that we are, by nature, sinful and unclean, and that we have sinned against you by thought, word, and deed. Wherefore, we flee for refuge to your infinite mercy, seeking and imploring your grace for the sake of our Lord Jesus Christ. O most merciful God, who has given your only begotten Son to die for us, have mercy upon us, and for his sake grant us remission of all our sins. And by your Holy Spirit, increase in us true knowledge of you and of your will, in true obedience to your word, to the end that by your grace we may come to everlasting life. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, has had mercy upon us and has given his only Son to die for us, and for his sake forgives us all our sins. To those who believe on his name, he gives power to become the children of God and has promised them his Holy Spirit. He that believes and is baptized shall be saved. Grant this, Lord, unto us all. Amen. Our scripture reading is from the Gospel according to St. Mark, the fourth chapter. And Jesus said, The kingdom of God is as if a man should scatter seed on the ground. He sleeps and rises night and day, and the seed sprouts and grows. He knows not how. The earth produces by itself first the blade, then the ear, then the full grain in the ear. But when the grain is ripe, at once he puts in the sickle, because the harvest has come. And he said, With what can we compare the kingdom of God? Or what parable shall we use for it? It is like a grain of mustard seed, which, when sown on the ground, is the smallest of all the seeds on earth. Yet, when it is sown, it grows up and becomes larger than all the garden plants and puts out large branches so that the birds of the air can make nests in its shade. With many such parables, he spoke the word to them, as they were able to hear it. He did not speak to them without a parable, but privately to his own disciples. He explained everything. I have pretty much been interested in how things work all my life. That curiosity prepared me for my teenage years when I had to repair equipment around our farm. And it especially prepared me for the years after that that I spent working in the electronics industry. One thing that I was always curious about as to how it actually worked had nothing to do with technology, although it does have a close connection to farming. I always wondered how the seeds of various plants actually did their thing. How something that was small and seemingly lifeless could develop into something living and vibrant, even massive. We did an experiment back in second grade or thereabouts, which you may have done as well. Our teacher had us take a paper cup, fill it with dirt, plant a bean seed in it, and then set it on a sunny windowsill in our classroom. We kept it watered and we patiently waited. Suddenly, one day when we came to class, we noticed something. A living plant had emerged from the soil. 
With me being wired the way that I am, I wanted to know what it was exactly that went on inside that seed during those days while we were waiting. How in the world did it know when to start growing? It had been sealed in a paper envelope for months, if not years, with no sign that it was ever going to do anything other than to just quietly sit there. What activated it and caused it to live and thrive? I may have wanted to know about that, but I never did get an answer that I was totally satisfied with, neither in second grade nor in the years that followed. I and my classmates could obviously observe what was happening as the plant was growing, but how that growth came about and the reason why it did so when it did, that was something that fell into the realm of being a mystery or, if you will, an act of God. Both of the parables that we hear Jesus telling in Mark's gospel have to do with the how and the what of something that is growing. Jesus isn't relaying this parable to us in order to give us some special privileged botanic insight or to satisfy my curious mind regarding beans. Honestly, he's actually not teaching us about the growth of plants at all, but rather he's teaching us about the growth of the kingdom of God, the church. In that first parable, Jesus talks about a man who spreads a bunch of seed on the ground. That seed sprouts and grows. He knows not how. And then from that seed, the earth produces by itself first the blade, then the ear, then the full grain in the ear. For me, this is the second grade all over again. The seed is planted, and it sprouts and grows to maturity. But how? How? All by itself. The Greek word that appears there, automatos, is where we get our word automatically from. The seed doesn't need or get help from the person who sowed it. The farmer or gardener isn't responsible for what that seed does after it's been spread in any way, shape, or form. He is only responsible for its planting. And that, that is what the kingdom of God is like, Jesus says. Since we're dealing with a parable here, a, a story that takes something that we are familiar with at an earthly level and, and uses it to try to explain something that is beyond human comprehension and explanation, since we're dealing with a parable, let's take a moment to define who or what a couple of the key components of this parable are. Because what Jesus is saying really is all about the kingdom of God, the seed that is being spread is God's word, the gospel the message about what Jesus has done for all of us sinners by dying and rising to bring us life. And the ones to whom God has given the task of spreading the seed, that is you and me, Christ's followers in faith. The full grain in the ear that gets harvested at just the right point in time are the believers who have come to life and who have grown in their faith and, and who are then gathered by God at Christ's second coming. Now, just as we are not responsible for and are not participants in getting the seed that we put into our garden or our flower bed to go from being spread and laying there to growing and thriving, it is not up to us to get the seed of God's word to sprout and to take root so that someone comes to faith and makes it to heaven. How that spiritual growth happens is like the growth of a bean plant from a seed. It's a mystery to us. It's an act of God. The Apostle Paul made that same point that Jesus is making about the growth of God's kingdom when he wrote in 1 Corinthians, I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the growth. Neither he who plants nor he who waters is anything, but only God who gives the growth. Now this is where we can struggle. We don't always believe that that's the way things work when it comes to the kingdom of God, do we? What we do and the way that we act reveals that we don't total, totally accept that it is God and God alone who gives the growth when and where he wills it to happen. If a congregation is expanding and attendance is going up, 
whether it's in our congregation or another one, we look for that certain something that is being done that's drawing people in. It must be the pastor, the music, the drama. No, it can't be the pastor. He's old and he's kind of a jerk. It's got to be the way that the place is decorated or how friendly we are, how phenomenal our coffee and fellowship treats are. That is why the church is growing and increasing. But Jesus says that God's kingdom, the church, grows automatos, on its own, without our involvement. Only God gives the growth. However, if God is the one who causes his kingdom, the church, to grow, then why isn't our congregation and every other congregation that still proclaims the word of God faithfully, why aren't they all adding services and building on because they're running out of space for their worshipers? God wants people to be saved, right? Well, the growth may not be happening here in this particular place at this particular time, as far as we can see and tell with our sin-tainted senses. But that doesn't mean that it is not happening. That's what Jesus' second parable is about. The New Testament church started out small, like a, a tiny seed. He uses a mustard seed as an example. It initially consisted of just a handful of men and women who believed and trusted in the risen and living Christ. But then it grew. It grew from that meager beginning and multiplied. Not everywhere, not always so that you could see it happening, not because of any gimmicks or programs or because Folgers extra premium ground caramel cashew lattes were being served during fellowship time. It grew because God gave the growth. What part do the members of the early church play in this growth? They just kept spreading the seed wherever they went, and they let God do his thing. The followers of Jesus didn't always get to observe an immediate and sizable response to their spreading efforts. At times, the, the seed appeared to lay on the rocks, or to rot in the ground like a bunch of our sweet corn seeds that we put out in our garden did this year. But yet, God was still giving growth to his kingdom. The parable of the mustard seed reminds us that even though we not, might not be noticing an instantaneous, remarkable growth taking place right before our eyes, God is still at work expanding his kingdom, causing more seeds of the gospel to bring life to dead sinners like us in various places across the globe. And in the end, when Christ returns in glory, we're going to get to see just how hard God has been working and how massive the number of plants in God's garden of the saved really is. John writes in Revelation chapter 7, after this, I looked, and behold, a great multitude that no one could number from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands and crying out with a loud voice, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. It only took one seed being planted into the earth to bring about, about that great number, the seed of the woman, Christ. Jesus said, truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Jesus didn't get or need help from us or from anybody else to do that. He did it all on his own so that we can become members of his heavenly kingdom. So what is it that we are supposed to be doing as we wait for his return and that great revealing of God's kingdom, the church in heaven? Are we to be spending our time coming up with all sorts of tactics and stunts that will cause God's kingdom to grow? That's not what God tells us to do. All that he tells us to do is to keep on spreading the seed, 
Keep on sharing the message about what Christ has done to make things right between God and us sinners. From there, God will take care of the rest. That's his job. And it will be done according to his good pleasure on his timetable until the full number of believers are ready for the harvest. And then the end will come. Amen. We pray. O most high God, we give thanks that you have planted your holy word among us. Give healthy growth to your church that she may weather the storm winds of this world steadfast in Christ, ever bearing the fruits of love and singing praises to your holy name. Lord God, your Holy Spirit causes your word to sprout and grow as it pleases you. Bless the preaching and teaching of that word so that your kingdom may be extended and give us thankful hearts to marvel at your work. Send faithful laborers into your fields to scatter your seed both here and abroad so that in due time a harvest may be reaped for your glory. Lord, we especially ask at this time that you send an extra measure of grace to our brothers and sisters in the faith in the South Wisconsin District of the Missouri Synod. As you, according to your good pleasure, called District President John Willie away from the work that you gave him to do in this world and to your side in glory. O God, we groan under many burdens in this earthly tent and we long to be clothed with the eternal perfection that you promise us in the life to come. Father, hear us as we intercede in Jesus' name for those in every need on this side of heaven. Especially look in favor upon Phil, Ronnie, Chuck, Mike, Helen, Linda, Nancy, Virgin, Jace, Harlan, Colleen, Jim, Ken, Dolores, Amy, Michael, and all others who come to mind. Grant them peace and give them strong faith in your goodness. O Lord, what you have spoken, you will surely do. We implore you for the sake of Christ and your many precious promises to bless and defend our homes. We give you thanks for earthly fathers. Make the efforts of all parents fruitful in their teaching of their children. Preserve them in the true saving faith of Jesus until the time of your harvest. We ask this in Christ's holy name. And we also pray the prayer that he has taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you now and always. Amen.